Hey everybody, welcome back to the Boone County Museum of History Teacher Box series. Today we are going to be talking about the Illinois Native Americans. So let's open up the box and see what we have inside. Now, the land we all live in today did not used to be a city with thousands of people living in it. It did not used to be open farmland either. It used to be populated by the indigenous people to this land, the Winnebago's, Sauk, Foxes, Illini, Miami, and others. 300 years ago, when French explorers first visited the Illinois country, the natural environment looked very different from the way it appears today. At that time, the landscape was a patchwork of prairies, forests, marshes, and swamps. Bison and elk roamed the upland prairies, bears and mountain lions prowled the forests and swamps, and the skies were often darkened by large flocks of passenger pigeons. These people lived a completely different lifestyle and had a completely different culture than what we live in today. The artifacts in this trunk shed some light on how they lived their day-to-day -day lives along with how their lives suddenly changed when white Europeans came into contact with them. Try to take a different perspective on this topic and imagine what would it be like to be a Native American. Imagine their way of life and living off the land around them. Okay, now the first thing out of the box today are big thunder arrowheads. Now, these specific arrowheads were found at the burial site of Chief Big Thunder. These points could have been his and could have been buried with him at his burial in the early 1800s. Big Thunder was a noted character among his people, not from his stature, which was under the medium average of his race, but from his influence among them. His voice, perhaps, gave him the name he bore, as it is a prevailing practice with nearly all Indian tribes to name any object after that of which it reminds them. Big Thunder, no doubt, was possessed with a strong, booming voice that in councils or giving words of command reminded his tribe or followers of a deep, distant thunder, and there the name. Our next item is a hide cleaner. In ancient times, the hides of animals were depended on for clothing, blankets, and covering for structures. Once an animal was killed, the hide, or skin, would be removed, staked to the ground, and then the fat that remained on the underside of the skin had to be removed in order for the hide to be cured. Depending on the animal, some hides had very little fat, such as rabbits, squirrels, and deer, while others have a significantly thick layer of fat, such as raccoons, possums, and buffalo. If the fat was not removed properly, the hide would not cure properly, and thus scraping hides was a daily task that had to be done and could not be rushed. These scrapers would have been used on all kinds of hides, including the deer skin in this teacher trunk. See how only the hide is left and all of the residue has been removed from the hide? This allowed the hide to cure and become flexible and usable and to be made into countless products. These scrapers allowed for effective use of these hides, which was crucial for the Indian survival. Our next item is a deer hide. Deer hides were used to make clothes, shelters, quivers, drum heads, and many other items. Native Americans used all parts of the animal and did not waste anything from the animal. Deer would have been one of the primary sources for hide, bone tools, and meat for tribes in the Boone County area. Okay, our next object is antlers. Bone attained from animals like deer, elk, and bison were modified to create a variety of tools. Beamers for scraping animal hides, awls for sewing, needles for making reed mats, and wrenches for strengthening arrow shafts. The shoulder blades of bison were perforated and attached to long handles to create hose, which were used not just to weed gardens, but also to dig holes in the ground. Bison horns were cut and polished to make scoop-shaped ladles for eating food. Deer bones and antlers were made into a variety of tools, weapons, and ceremonial items. The top part of the skull was made into spoons, while leg bones were formed into knife handles. Deer antlers could also be cut and scraped to create cone-shaped projectile points that were attached to the ends of long wooded spears. Bone slivers were made into fine sewing needles and awls. Archaeologists have found deer antlers sheathed in copper, which may have been worn ceremoniously by tribal shamans. The antlers were also made into buttons, beads, and carved sculptures. Our next object are stone axe heads. These are all different style of stone axes. These would have served a wide variety of uses. Before Europeans came to America, Native Americans would use stone axes attached to wooden handles secured with strips of rawhide to chop, war to chop wood or to be used as a war club. The general differences between a tomahawk and an axe was how it was used. An axe was used in camp for chores and chopping wood, while a tomahawk was used in battle. 
Although stone axes had been used as tools and ritual objects by Native Americans for thousands of years, the axe did not become popular as a weapon until after Europeans had introduced iron and steel to Native tribes. In fact, the word tomahawk, which is now synonymous with Indian-style fighting hatchets, originally referred to a war, and war club in the Pow Powhatan language. Once steel became available, however, axes with metal heads eclipsed more, the more old-fashioned war clubs as a Native American melee weapon of choice, and the word tomahawk began to be widely used to refer to this style of weapon. Today, tomahawks are being incorporated into the U.S. military for a variety of uses, just like the Native Americans. It was used to open doors and crates to dig trenches and for use in combat as well. Our next object is a stone grinder. Commonly called a mano, a smooth handheld stone is used against a metate, which is typically a large stone with a depression or a bowl. The movement of the mano against the metate consists of circular rocking or chopping grinding motion using one or both hands. This would have been used to grind up maize, seeds, plants, and other foods to either make them easier to eat or to produce flour. This could then be used to bake bread or other foods. This simple technique allowed for the creation of a much wider array of foods to eat. Our next object is maize. Over a period of thousands of years, Native Americans purposefully transformed maize through special cultivation techniques. Maize was developed from a wild grass, originally growing in Central America 7,000 years ago. The ancient kernels looked very different from today's corn. These kernels were small and not fused together like the kernels on the husked ear of early maize and modern corn. By systematically collecting and cultivating those plants best suited for human consumption, Native Americans encouraged the formation of ears or cobs of an early maize. The first ears of maize were only a few inches long and had only eight rows of kernels. Cob length and size of, nearly, of early maize grew over the next several thousand years, which gradually increased the yield of each crop. Eventually, the productivity of maize cultivation was great enough to make it possible and worthwhile for a family to produce food for the bulk of their diet for an entire year from a small area. This weed has been transformed into a massive-sized cob of corn, which is now one of the staple agricultural products in northern Illinois and in the Midwest in general. Simply look around Belvedere and one can see the effect of this Native American plant of, on the Belvedere community. Our next object in the box is a beaver and duck bowl. These bowls are representative of Mississippian culture and are replicas of actual bowls found at the Cahokia excavation site. Both animals played a heavy role in Native American lives, which is why they would have been modeled items after them. These bowls are made of clay, but dried gourds could have also been used to make bowls. The purpose of these bowls would have been to store items like seeds, beads, or other food items. Our next object out of the box are moccasins. All American Indian moccasins were originally made of soft leather, usually deer skin, stitched together with sinew. Though the basic construction of Native American moccasins was similar throughout North America, moccasin patterns were suddenly different in nearly every tribe. The Indian people could often tell each other's tribal affiliation simply from the design of their shoes. In fact, the common names of some large nations like the Blackfoot and the Chippewas referred to their characteristic moccasin styles. Tribal differences included not only the cut of the moccasins, but also the extensive beadwork, quillwork, painted designs, and fringes many Indian people lavished on their moccasins. In some tribes, hardened rawhide was used for the sole for added durability, and in others, rabbit fur, or later sheepskin, was used to lend the leather moccasins for added warmth. Both men and women wore moccasins, although in many different tribes, the decoration of male and female moccasins used a different pattern. Our next item is a chunky. This chunky stone was part of the game that originated in the Mississippian culture near the Cahoka around 600 CE. This game evolved into a huge sport that was played in massive arenas and attracted huge crowds of spectators. The game was played by rolling a cylindrical stone out onto a field. Once the stone stopped, the players would throw spears at the stone and whoever got closest to the stone won the game. The game is similar to the game bocce ball that is played today. Our next item is called the buzz. The buzz is an ancient Native American toy common to many nations. Prehistoric flat disks of stone or pottery with two holes are familiar finds for archaeologists working from northeast woodland to the southeast woodland Canyon de Chelly in Arizona. The flat disks have been made from wood, hide, gourd, pottery, bone, and shell. The Etsina of Montana, the Oglala 
Dakota and the Mono Native Americans of California used knuckle or knee bone as the buzz discs. Cords were made of sinew, cotton, or wool. The flat discs were often engraved or painted with designs. These designs created new patterns and optical illusions when the toy spins. To play, wind up the disc on the string by flipping. After the disc is wound up, start an oscillating motion by pulling intermittently on the end of the cord. Be patient and listen to the sound. The buzz when properly spinning makes a sound similar to the sound of wind sighing. Our next object is ring and pin. Nearly every Native American nation across North America has a version of ring and pin. The English name ring and pin was suggested by Dr. George A. Dorsey and first used by Stuart Cullen in his classic study of Native American games published in 1907. Hundreds of versions exist with different names, depending on the tribe. Different nations use a variety of materials to make the game, but the object of the game was always the same. The type of material used for targets depended on the culture of that nation or tribe. Some targets were carved rings of bone or hide, dried squash rinds, fish vertebrae, ivory, animal skins, wood, or bundles of twigs. The pins were often long bones or sticks. After contact with Europeans, some tribes started using metal pins. Often a leather or fur counterweight or loop of beads was attached below the target. In some versions, the players get 10 tosses and a point each time the scores are compared to see who wins. The game was often played for stakes. To play. In this version, hold the sinew string at the end of the wooden stick in your hand and swing the target up in the air. Try to catch the target with a stick and a spear hole.